All right, good evening. Good evening. Good evening. We don't normally carry swords here in this church. It's, it's just for illustration purposes. Don't worry. Amen. You can turn your Bible tonight to Ephesians chapter 6. We'll talk about something that the Lord has given us to help us to wage spiritual warfare while we're here on this earth. Amen. Uh, this is something that I've dedicated my life to, and that's the defense of God's Word, God's written Word, and uh, that being for the English-speaking people, the King James Version of the Bible. Amen. Amen. I have plenty of information on that if you have any questions. I'm probably going to touch a little bit on that as we continue but in this uh, study tonight, but... Um, we're going to start out here in verse 13. It says here, Wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. And I've been over this before, I've said this before. Are we living in an evil day? Yes. yes. Amen. That's right. Absolutely. Okay, we are in the enemy camp right now, yes. this world. Now, we have little sanctuaries like this place here. You can come be with other members of the body of Christ. This is a safe haven. You're not going to see lewd images or hear profanity or things here like that. Amen. But when you go out there in the world, it's an evil day out there. Amen. It's evil all the time. So what do you need in that, in that time period? Look at verse 14. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation <coughs> and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Now, something that you see in your King James Bible, whenever there's a lowercase w, that refers to this, to the written word. When you see a capital W, that's a reference to Jesus Christ. That's one of his unique titles. There are seven references in the King James Bible to the capital W, Word of God. Okay? Your new versions, like the NIV in particular, take out one of those references, which drops the number from seven down to six. Interesting number if you know Bible prophecy. Okay? And Bible numbers. Okay? What about this thing of the sword of the Spirit? Turn over to Hebrews chapter 4. We'll see something very interesting here. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12. It says here, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and opened unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Question. Which one of these two is more dangerous? Yeah. This one right here. Yeah. This is the one that's banned, last I heard, in over nine countries. And those same nine countries don't ban these. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Because this book changes lives. Amen. This book right. can get in to places spiritually that something like this can't. Amen. Now there are certain churches out there, like Islam and like Roman Catholicism, that think they have power here and here. Spiritual and temporal. That's not Bible-believing Christianity. Amen. This is not how we spread our religion. This is how we spread our religion. Okay? So when you start seeing any kind of religion that's calling for this to spread the faith, you're dealing with a false call. Amen. Okay? That's not how we do it. But the Bible is likened unto this right here. This is a double-edged sword. And it's very sharp, so later on if you look at it, you know, don't touch the edges. Because <laughs> you'll see how sharp it is. But there are two ways to enter into spiritual combat. <coughs> Okay, and you will get into spiritual combat if you are saved. That's the reason for Ephesians chapter 6. We live in an evil world. Okay, You will be confronted if you are a Christian. And there are two ways to do this. Turn back to Proverbs chapter 3. Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 5. So we're going to go. Ok, 
Okay, Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Now somebody comes to you and they say, why do you believe what you believe? There are two ways that you can answer. You can say, well, because the Bible says, that's acknowledging the Lord, acknowledging the word of the Lord. Or you can say, well, I feel. What are you doing when you do that? Well, you're leaning on your own understanding. Amen. And it's kind of interesting, and I'm not making fun of somebody who has a physical handicap uh, impairment of blindness, but what is the way that a blind person gets around? By feeling. <coughs> Isn't that interesting? And what did Jesus Christ say about the Pharisees? He said they are blind leaders of the blind. Why? Well, I feel that uh, my opinions are important. I feel, I feel. They don't care about what the Word of God says. Okay? That's not how you should be as a Christian. You should know this book so well that when it comes time somebody says, Hey, why do you believe that? You should be able to answer them from the Bible. Okay. Right. That's very, very important. And it's going to get more and more important as we go into you know, the, the times ahead. It's going to get a lot worse. But why did the Lord give us the written word? Okay, John chapter 14. Turn it over there. I mean, why not just have the Holy Spirit reveal things to each of us, you know, and just speak through us? Why would He actually want us to have a copy of the written word? Over this not too long ago in our weekly Bible study, John chapter 14, verse 22. It says here, Judas saith unto him, not Iscariot, Lord, how is it that thou wilt manifest thyself unto us and not unto the world? Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words. And my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. The thing that separates us from the world, the thing that makes us right, you know, people say, you think you're right and we're wrong? Well, if it's on, if we're in line with Scripture, yeah. That's right, amen. That's not being arrogant, that's just the truth. Amen. Okay? The Lord gives us his word so that we can know the truth. Amen. amen. That's right. That's right. The world doesn't have it. The world is in blindness. They are in darkness. Until they get saved, they don't know what's going on. They don't know the truth. But notice there it says, if a man love me, he will keep my words. There's another place in Scripture I don't have written down here, but Jesus said, if a man is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed. You know? What's the number one reason for changing this book, this King James Bible? It's too archaic. It's too hard to understand. What are they doing? They're ashamed of it. Okay, that's the reason for it. Now, turning your Bible back to Isaiah chapter 49. This isn't going to be a real in-depth study tonight. Isaiah chapter 49, verse 1. I'm going to show you something interesting here. People talk about, are you Christ-like? Let's see about an aspect of Jesus Christ that most modern Christians don't want to imitate. Isaiah chapter 49, verse 1. Listen, O isles, unto me, and hearken ye people from far. The Lord hath called me from the womb, and the bowels of my mother hath he made mention of my name. And he hath made my mouth like a sharp sword, in the shadow of his hand hath he hid me, and made me a polished shaft, in his quiver hath he hid me. Now what did we just read over there in Hebrews chapter 14, verse 12? Yeah, chapter 14, verse 12. Or did I get the right? 4, verse 12. Excuse me. What did we just read? The sharp sword is the word of God. Okay? Right there, Isaiah says, he's made my mouth like a sharp sword. Say, well, how does that relate to Jesus Christ? Turn back in your Bible to the book of Revelation, chapter 19.
Revelation chapter 19. This event has not taken place yet. This is not symbolic. Right. A lot Amen. of people say. This is going to be literal. Amen. This is going to happen. Revelation chapter 19 verse 11 says, And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Who was that? Did I say about the Word of God? This is Jesus Christ that we're reading about right here. Now what an image of Jesus Christ. You know, people think of Jesus as meek and mild and things, and he was that. He came here and he died on the cross for sins. Okay, he went without complaining. He went, he, he didn't speak a word while he was being accused and all these lies being said about him. That is Jesus, but this is Jesus too. Amen. You see, you can't just take parts of the Bible and say, well, this is the Jesus that I worship. You, know, you have to worship the Jesus of the whole Bible. Amen. That's why you have to read the Bible. You have to study the Bible. But continuing here, verse 14, and the armies... We read in Ephesians chapter 6, you are likened to a soldier if you are saved. If you're a Christian, you are a soldier for Jesus Christ. And you're really going to be a soldier at this point in time. The armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. So you have Isaiah back there saying, He's made my mouth like a sharp sword. Here you have the Lord Jesus Christ, and his mouth is like a sharp sword. If you know your Bible, and you are able to quote this Bible, when you get into binds, when you get into people attacking you, attacking the Bible, attacking Jesus Christ, and you quote scripture to them, that sharp sword is coming out of your mouth. Okay, and you will do damage to that person. I guarantee it. I read a story the one time about a woman that was a prostitute, and she said a, a young girl from the Salvation Army witnessed to her. And she said, the girl quoted scripture to her, and she said it felt like she was stabbed in the heart. And she, at the time, she laughed about it and walked away and laughed that this girl made a fool out of her. But the point is, it hurt. Okay? This is a spiritual weapon right here. And that's why you should know it. Amen. And I'm going to show you another reason why you should know it too. Jeremiah chapter 48. We went over this verse the other week too. But this is another one that's <coughs> very important. And this kind of gives you an idea. I said earlier about Jesus Christ is ashamed of those who do not, uh, who are ashamed of his word. And this is another reason why he's ashamed. Jeremiah chapter 48, verse 10 says, Cursed be he that doeth the work of the Lord deceitfully, and cursed be he that keepeth back his sword from blood. Now again, that's not talking about this. This is not, you know, you as a Christian, you have to go out and cut people. No, it's not talking about that. It's spiritual. That's what it's talking about. But let me ask you a question. Let's say that you're on a battlefield, and... It's getting, you know, battle's pretty bad. You're, you're fighting and everything, and your fellow soldiers are there fighting with you. And you look and you see another soldier, and he's just walking around like this. Sword's in the sheath. And he's not, he's avoiding conflict. What are you going to think of that soldier? Are you going to say, oh, that's up to them. They don't need to fight or anything. First of all, you're going to think they're a coward. Secondly, you're going to think that they're a traitor. And that's what the Lord thinks. Notice he doesn't say, hey, I'm fairly indifferent to somebody that does the work of the Lord deceitfully. He says, cursed be he. And he says, Jesus in, in the New Testament says that he's ashamed of somebody who's ashamed of his work. I think it's a very serious thing. And yet how many times as Christians do we get into situations where people are making fun of the word of God and we keep our mouths shut? Mm -hmm. We take the sword of the spirit, we just kind of Tuck it away. Oh, I don't, you know, I don't know. I can't really comment. It's a bad thing. Amen. You're supposed to get in combat. You're supposed to fight as a Christian. 
Now, you're not to, supposed to be in strife all the time. I understand that. But there are times that you're going to be called upon. The Lord's going to put you in a situation. Somebody's going to open their mouth and blaspheme the Lord, use his name in vain or something else. And the Lord's going to expect you to open your mouth and that sharp sword to come out. That's what he's going to expect. And if you don't, well, I think he's going to have something to say about that. Mm. Amen. And by the way, why are we in such rotten shape today in this country? Yeah, amen. Because Christians shut their mouths. Mm -hmm. You know, I remember I heard a thing one time and some guy said, blood will run in the streets before <coughs> prayer is taken out of schools. Mm -hmm. It's take, been taken out, hasn't it? Yeah. Yes. And we allow lies like evolution and all kinds of other things in the schools and we've kept our mouths shut. Mm -hmm. We haven't been the soldiers that we're supposed to be. <coughs> And I'll tell you something, study the history sometime in this book. This book came from saints and martyrs of Jesus Christ being slaughtered. Amen. That's why you have this King James Bible. <coughs> and now people are going back to the Roman Catholic Church that slaughtered the Christians and using their versions, the new versions. I mean, I, I have a ministry. I'm just going to say the website here, kingjamesvideoministries.com. We have over 250 videos on there for free. You can go in there and you can watch this stuff documented. It's proven. Amen. Amen. Okay? The Catholic Church is behind the Nestle's text. They say so right in the introduction. The Vatican, this text has been made under the supervision of the Vatican. The very people that killed the Christians that brought this book out, that worked so hard to get this book into our hands, they're the ones that are now behind all of the new versions produced since 1881. Mm -hmm. Document. It's not a matter of my opinion. It's not a matter of my feelings. It's documented. I have the books that own the proof. Amen. Amen. Okay? And you say, well, what about the, these more accurate readings that they've come out with to replace this King James Bible? I can show you I have a 1610 Catholic Dewey Reams Bible with every single updated verse in it <laughs> that came out preceding this. The Catholic, it's the Catholic Bible versus the Christian Bible. Amen. That's what this thing has been. You know? Again, that's a, another issue we could go on about for quite some time. But we're going to look at one more place in Scripture, Romans chapter 13. This is mostly the main reason why I wanted to, to do this little message tonight. Romans chapter 13, verses 1 through 4. Just as kind of a warning. Okay, it says here in Romans chapter 13, Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. Okay, so let me ask you a question. Who put Obama into office? Lord. The Lord. Who put Hitler into office in Germany? The Lord. The Lord. Well, you see, you study Nazi Germany, before Hitler was put into power, they were decadent. They were in sin. They were wicked. Why did God, we're reading right now, my wife and I are going through the book of Jeremiah, and we see God saying to the Israelites, repent, turn, get away from this stuff, get away from this idolatry, and they won't do it. And so the Lord says, I'm going to bring Nebuchadnezzar, my servant, in upon you. Guess why Nebuchadnezzar came in? Because the Jews were wicked. Guess why Adolf Hitler came in? Because the Germans were wicked. Guess why Obama came in? Because the American people are wicked. Amen. Say, well, you're not a very good American. Well, that makes me a bad American, so be it. <laughs> you know, it's the truth. Amen. It's the way it is. But now, I want you to see something here, and this is very important. <coughs> understand because a lot of people I've heard this thing preached on a couple times and they'll read the first two verses and then they skip verses three and four okay and they'll jump down to verse five I want to read verses three and four make a very important point okay the Lord says yeah I put the ruler in but now he defines the kind of ruler that you are to submit to look at verse three for rulers are not a terror to good works but to the evil Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. 
But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain, for he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Question. Did God put Nebuchadnezzar into power? Yes. Yes. Did the Jews obey Nebuchadnezzar and everything he said? No. Did God put Adolf Hitler in power? Yes. Did the people of Germany obey Adolf Hitler and everything he said? No. Did God put Obama into power? Yes. Should we obey him in everything that he says? No. If he becomes a terror to good works, we have a right as Christians to say, my Bible says Amen. such and such. You're saying against my Bible. I'm not going to submit to you. Amen. Okay? Amen. And I want to tell you right now, it's not that Obama kind of might be anti-Christian. This guy has come out and said publicly that I have him on video, one of my older sermons. He actually said that when he was over in Germany calling for a, a global order and all this stuff, he actually said that there are walls between religions and we need to tear these walls down. Yeah. Well, guess what, Christian? If you leave this book right here, you are that wall. Yes, sir. Amen. You know? yeah, you're... I'm not going to join with the Muslims. Amen. I'm not going to join with the Catholics. I'm not going to join with the Mormons, the Jehovah's Witnesses, whoever. Amen. Sorry, not going to happen. Amen. Okay? Amen. Oh, but he's the ruler. He said to do it. No. No. And I want to tell you something else. Right here is a weapon. This is a real sword. This is not a toy. Now, nobody here has any reason to fear me tonight because of this sword. I'm not going to hurt anybody. But what if you were a criminal and you were trying to get into my house or something like that? You knew that I had this? See? You have reason to fear. Amen. Amen. The only reason you should fear a just person with a weapon is if you yourself are crooked. Amen. Okay? Amen. The only reason a preacher should ever fear a Christian with this book is if that preacher is crooked. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Why do you think these big modern churches are teaching the people not to bring Bibles? Yeah. And saying, get 15 different versions, the one that you prefer. Why do you think? Because they want to take away the Word of God from their heart. Amen. Rick Warren, the famous you know, big mega church pastor, he actually said in his 40 days of purpose, <coughs> He said, you shouldn't use just one Bible because it can become too familiar. <laughs> it's in the back. It's in the end. He says it right in there. You should use as many versions as you can so that it doesn't become too familiar. See, he's afraid of being attacked and exposed by this book. Amen. That's why he wants to disarm the Christians. Now, I can tell you right now, Obama does not want an armed populace. And I mean that both in the physical realm and in the spiritual but I want to state this publicly. If Obama ever makes this book illegal, declares it hate literature or something like that, I'm not giving in my Bible. Amen. I don't care if he passes a law, it goes through Congress, it's signed into law, he's not getting my Bible. And I, it, I get really sick when I hear Christians and they say, well, someday we might lose our Bibles. It's like you, you're pre-defeated. Yeah. You know? yeah. Don't give up your Bible. Amen. Amen. I mean, my word. I mean, they can take a lot of things... But don't let them take this book. We had to fight for this book as Christians. Amen. Okay? I mean, you go back to the 1300s, there were people that were giving a month's salary for one page of Scripture because they were handwritten back then. You know? It wasn't until the 1500s that they were able to start printing Bibles, the Gutenberg Press. <coughs> but Bibles have been precious for centuries. It's only now that we kind of, oh, you know, you yeah, a Bible, whatever. Mm -hmm. But I'll tell you what. If you ever let Obama come in or some other corrupt leader, well, it could very well be Obama, if you ever let him come in and take away your physical weapons and then your spiritual weapons, you're going to see a very, very, very dark country. Yes, sir. A Amen. nightmare Amen. in this country. He's not getting my Bible. Amen. 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 So that's going to be it for this evening. Um, Brother Gordon, could you close the prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this message that we've heard. Lord, we thank you for the Word of God that uh, ultimately saved us. Lord, uh, thank you for the faith.